It's time for Security Now, a special edition on this uh, day after uh, Christmas. We're going to take the week off and let Steve do the talking from 1990. You want to know how hard drives used to work? Guess what? They still work the same way. Stay tuned. A trip back in time next on Security Now. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Audio bandwidth for Security Now is provided by the new Winamp for Android, featuring wireless sync and one-click iTunes import. Now with free daily music downloads and full-length CD listening parties. Download it for free at winamp.com slash android. Video bandwidth for Security Now is provided by CashFly at C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y dot com. This is Security Now with Steve Gibson, episode 384, published December 26th, 2012. Back in time. Security Now is brought to you by Ford, featuring Bliss, the blind spot information system with cross-traffic alert and active park assist. Check out these available features on the 2013 Ford Fusion and 2013 Ford Taurus and learn more at Ford.com slash technology. And by Audible.com. To download a free audiobook of your choice, visit audiblepodcast.com slash security now. And to get a copy of Brandon Sanderson's Legion absolutely free, visit audible.com slash Sanderson. It's time for Security Now, a very special edition of Security Now. We're uh, introducing this uh, the week before Christmas, but it will air on uh, December 26th. Steve Gibson is here. Happy holidays, Steve. Hey, Leo. Thanks very much. And Merry Christmas. This is the day after the uh, Christmas holiday. Boxing Boxing Day. Yeah, I guess probably many people who are normally listening to the podcast while they're commuting are probably not doing so this week. Uh, We hope you're in your jammies at home is what we hope. (laughs) They're off. And actually, that's a good thing because this is our special holiday security now. We agree to strongly endeavor never to have a dark week again. We made that mistake once and and heard about it for quite a while. So um, the, the reason it's good that people may be home is that this particular one really has to be seen and not just heard. Um, for some strange reason, my company recorded a series of presentations that I gave 22 years ago when I would have been 35 years old. Um, These were in Chicago for uh, what was called the Soft Sell Soft Teach, which was a a multi-city roadshow that I was invited to attend for our software distributor. This is back, you know, well before the internet when we copied software onto diskettes and there were manuals and they went in boxes and you got them at Micro Center and Egghead and, you know, Fry's and, and, and regular boxed software retailers. So Spinrite at the time was new. And I was explaining to these people how hard drives work. And I ended up sort of with a, a having it down pat or, you know, with a patter, which when I watched it again a couple of weeks ago, I thought, wow, I was pretty funny. <laughs> you were a showman. There's, there's a bunch of stuff that I had forgotten I had come up with, you know, like at the front of the audience standing there with my fingers by my, my hands, my arms by my side, my fingers sticking outwards, declaring myself to be a screw. And explaining <laughs> the how the difficult job of a screw, which is holding down the stepper motor in the hard drive because it dare not allow it move or the drive alignment will change. And so I there's a lot of pantomime. It's very physical. I'm I'm taking advantage of the fact that I'm there in body in front of the audience. So, you know, this podcast I'm I'm always very conscious of the fact that the majority of our listeners are doing so in audio, so it isn't heavily graphics 
dependent. You know, back when you and I were doing the tech TV stuff, I, yeah, there was a lot of graphics because it was TV was, you know, everyone was seeing it who was right. hearing us. There was no so, audio version. Right. So I would urge our listeners for this episode, I, I think it'll be worth your while. You'll get a kick out of it. And I'd forgotten the level of detail that I went into in order to describe the things that Spinrite does. I would bet that every single listener learned something, even now, about hard drives that they didn't know. Um, so it's actually I funny because it, in though you know, I would have if you'd asked me in that what was it ninety five ninety six. What? Uh, no, 90, 1990. 90? If you'd asked yeah, me... Yeah, 20, 22 years ago. In 1990, if in 20 years we'd still be using hard drives, I would have mocked you. I would have said, oh, no, that technology, that has <laughs> that can't continue. We're going to be using <laughs> holographic memory cubes, of course. Well, actually, I even talk about those. I'm not really? kidding you, Leo. Those <laughs> really? holographic memory cubes are in that, are in that <laughs> video presentation. But 22 we just, years ago. It, it, what's interesting is the same technology that you were describing 22 years ago is, is pretty much how it works today, right? Yeah. With a few it's, it's added amazing. details. Yes. It's amazing how little of it has changed. Some has, but I just, it's a, it's a perfect, fun, wacky holiday podcast. Uh, but again, let, let me urge people. I mean, maybe you'll not believe this and you'll listen to it and you'll go, okay, I have to see what he was doing when everyone was laughing at him. So... In that case, you'll probably end up watching. <laughs> You're spinning around like a screw. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, all right. Well, uh, we're going to get to that in just a little bit. Steve Gibson explaining how hard drive worked. Hard drives worked in 1990. I can't wait to see. Do you have hair? Yes, it's black. <laughs> oh, my God. It's a huge black mustache. Oh, I can't I, wait to see this. You know, Jenny just looked at it because I showed it to her a couple weeks ago. She's like, she's just staring at me with her mouth open. She says, I don't think I would recognize you. I mean, she knew me years before then, but then we had you know, a gap in our relationship. And she says, I, I don't think I would I would know who you were. So, yeah, <laughs> I did quite a different look. I love it. Well, um, before we before we get to that, uh, we want to mention our friends uh, at audible.com who've done such a great job with us uh, over the year. Uh, and have sponsored this show as well, even though because it's the day after uh, Christmas is probably, you know, normally you don't you don't do radio ads this time of year because they think nobody's listening. But we know this is one actually that gets more listeners, these holiday specials, and I suspect this one will. Audible is a great place to go if you like to listen to what you read. What? Your books. Audio books. 100,000 strong at audible.com. And, uh, and I'm going to tell you how you can get one free. How about that? All you got to do is go to audiblepodcast.com slash security now, and you'll be signing up for the gold account. What a great way to begin 2013. Whenever you're in the car, you're at the gym, you're cleaning the house, I listen all the time. You can learn. You can have fun. You can have a great time. <laughs> And you can sometimes you can laugh out loud. Look at this one from Julie Klausner. I don't care about your band. What I learned from indie rockers, trust funders, pornographers, felons, faux sensitive hipsters, and other guys I've dated. I, I don't know what it's about, but that sounds like fun. Maybe you'd like something a little more serious. Arthur Conan Doyle, The Adventure of the Blue Carbuncle. Hmm. Sherlock Holmes mystery. And I got to I got to say when they this is narrated by Alan Cumming. Let me play a little bit. When they get readers, they get I readers. I had called upon my friend Sherlock Holmes upon the second morning after Christmas with the intention of wishing him the compliments of the season. This is a perfect one for the holidays. Actually, this one's free for Audible members. They do this all the time. They give you freebies. I want you to join Audible. So go to audiblepodcast.com/security now. Sign up for the gold account. That's a book a month. Your first month's free. Your first credit is free. You can cancel at any time. Pay nothing. And it's yours to keep. You like those Star Wars books? There's a new one coming out. The brand new one, Scoundrels, will be out January 1st, New Year's Day. I love these. It really is. It just it, it It's something to put on your phone. They have apps for BlackBerry, Android, iPhone, and Windows Phone 8 and 7 that uh, just will really fill your life with great audiobooks. We thank them so much for their support all year long in 2012 and look forward to working with them all through 2013. Audiblepodcast.com 
slash security now. Is there anything you want to say before we roll tape? And I mean tape. (laughs) Merry Christmas to all of our listeners. Thanks for uh, being with us for this last year and uh, heading into 2013. I'm sure we're going to have a lot more fun and great podcasts. So let's spin the time machine wheel as we go back to 1990. And <laughs> where I had hair. <laughs> and a hairy Steve Gibson. Let's talk about hard disks. Um, Steve, you're the guy If you ask somebody who has been associated with personal computers for a while, you know, what the least reliable component of a PC is, if you make the exception of the operator, uh, they probably say, well, the hard disk drive. You know, the common wisdom now is not, is this drive ever going to die, but, but when? And, you know, and then, of course, you ask the sub-question, yes, but exactly when? You know, because I'd like to back it up just before that. (laughs) Of course, they don't give you any notice, typically. And backing up is not a fun thing to do. It's not a very non-creative experience. And most people will tell you, oh, well, I know that I, I should have done that, but I just, you know, sort of never got around to it. Or, or oh, after I had my computer for two weeks, I backed it up. And you say, yeah, uh, when was that? Oh, two years ago? And you, you, you haven't used it since? Well, no, I've been using it, but it's been fine. Yeah. Why do drives die? Why have they got this bad reputation that sooner or later they're they're gonna you know give up? We know how to make things. We're a society that's very good about building things. We're putting men on all these other planets, and you know what we don't know how to do, the Japanese guys do. So together we've got the bases covered. Yet we've got drives die. And the Fuji drives are dying just as quickly as the Seagate drives are. (laughs) So what's the problem here? Well, let's look at it. Let's let's step back for a minute, look at the technology in the drive, and answer the question. So here's the drive. Mini scribe something or other. 3650. It's got three surfaces, or rather three platters, Six surfaces, one on each side. The engineers haven't figured out yet how to do a Mobius disk, but they probably will. Then that'll, that'll save them one head off for each disk. Um, so in this case, we've got three platters and six surfaces, and uh, one head for each surface. This is a so-called head tower, where the heads are all mounted, and you know each little heads are sitting on one of the surfaces. Then we have a little racket pinion mechanism down here that, that translates the drop, this stepper motor's rotary motion into the linear motion for moving the heads in and out. And that's basically it. You know, it, you know and this of course all spins around in order to allow us to get to all of the area on the different tracks. What we need to do in order to store data in this thing is to establish addressability. Right now, it's just sort of this empty domain of magnetism, potential grazing land for magnetic fields. We need to establish addressability. And we want to also protect ourselves against a problem which these drives have by virtue of the technology on them. Let's let's look at that. We have perhaps multiple surfaces, each with a head. So we need to select a head. So that's one dimension in our address. Then we need to know where on the surface, in or out wide, that is which track or cylinder on the surface we want to be. So that's the second dimension. And finally, where around the selected track do we are we wanting to do our reading and writing? So it's a third dimension. You know, so we sort of have a 3D coordinate system, which is not surprising because we live in a 3D coordinate system and, and the drive occupies a volume of space, so we need to talk to specific areas of it. So we have 3D. Well, in the cable that goes between the controller and the drive are some wires known as the head select lines. And taken in combination, they determine which of these surfaces is the active one at any given moment. 
It would be a problem, though, if the controller said, I want to be on surface number four, and sent that signal through the cable, through these a couple of these head select lines. If there was a break in the cable, or a bad connection at one end, or some goo on the connector that kept it from, from mating correctly, we wouldn't want the drive to hear that as hear the head four as head two because it would be working on the wrong surface. So we need some way of knowing that we really did get the surface over here that we asked for over on the controller side. Also, these, so that's, that's reliability in that first dimension. Secondly, we need to make sure that we're on the right track. These little stepping motors are nifty gizmos. They are getting the speeds of them up so that they're actually cutting into the market that the older voice coil actuators used to have. Voice coils tend not to be as reliable as the stepping motors. But, stepping motors have been known to misstep. Naturally, there's pressure on the engineers who design all this stuff to make them get where they're trying to go as quickly as they can. So that the manufacturer can say, we have a 63 millisecond seek time, or 25, or, or whatever it is. So they push them, maybe a little too far, enough so that every so often they misstep. So they don't actually get to the track that they were asked to go to. Well, if we were on track 25, the controller said, I want to do something out on track 100, so go out 75 steps. You know, and if we didn't, if we went you know, through in a freebie there, went out 76 or only 74, and didn't end up on track 100, that's a problem. It's not good enough just to write our data somewhere in the neighborhood. <laughs> we, we, we really need it to be on the right track. So, so we need a scheme for allowing us to address the data in the drive that prevents these kinds of confusions. Also, we need to chop our tracks up into smaller pieces. A track formatted with the least dense technology, called modified frequency modulation, has about 80,000 bits around its circumference. That's about 10,000 bytes. Well, that's a lot of bytes to just allocate in one lump. You know, if we had a little 40-byte config.sys file that said buffers equals 20, files equals 20, and we could only allocate with granularity of one track, well, it would take up 10K of the disk just for that little 40 byte file. So we chop the, the uh, tracks of the drive up into pieces. In fact, these pieces, it's nice, are all 512 bytes. It's nice because it turns out that's a galactic standard. Aliens have chosen 512 bytes also. <laughs> for their packet size. They don't have all this mechanical, they got those neat little cube things that are all solid and they work with laser beams and things. But they use 512 byte molecular string DNA polymer manipulation. So, <laughs> still, that means that they'll have an easier time getting to IBM compatibility. <laughs> so, where was I? Oh, so, um, so we need to label these sectors uniquely and give us some prevention against any kinds of problems. So that's where low-level formatting comes in. Low-level formatting ad establishes addressability on the drive. Basically, we go to every single track, on every surface, on every cylinder and everything, and lay down little signposts. These are called sector IDs, and they're just periodically plopped out on the disk as it's spinning. It spins at 3600 revolutions per minute, so that's 60 revolutions per second. It's whizzing. And so the controller, in low-level formatting, just blasts these out of the head every so often, and that spaces them evenly around the track. Then it goes to the next head, blasts those out, the next head blasts those, the next head and so forth, until it's done all of them on that cylinder of tracks, then moves to the next one. Each of these contains three vital pieces of data. The cylinder it's on, that is the, the track in and out, the surface it is a member of, and which sector it is around the disk. Now that may seem a little bit redundant, because after all, all the sectors on this surface 
say have they, they all have the same surface number written into them. Correspondingly, all the sectors on this track have the same track number. Except that there's a benefit here. If we encode the complete address of each sector in the sector's header, then all of them are unique. So we've completely uniquely labeled all the sectors in this 3D storage volume. Because, of course, you can't have two sectors that are in different places in the same location, by definition. Okay. So how does this work? The computer says, I want to write into sector number one, please, to the controller. The controller, that's what it's here for. So this is fine, you know, whatever you would say, boss. So this is sector number one. Well, we never know where the disk is at any given time as it's spinning around. So we just start listening. We put the head on the right track first and say, okay, we're, we're on the right track, so to speak. Um, and we start listening now. We open what's called a read channel from the proper surface, listening to everything going underneath the head. It's a very, very delicate magnetic listening device. And as each of these little signposts comes along, we check it. See, are you the one? Do we get a match here? No? Okay. And wait for the next one. You? A match? No? Okay. And so on. Eventually, we're going to find it. So, imagine the head running along here, finally hits this sector, this sector ID. It, says, it runs through it and says, ah, this is the guy. I got a match on everything, exactly what I was hoping for. In a little moment called the right switching interval, right afterwards, we turn the juice on to the head. We switch it from a read mode head, where it's a delicate magnetic listening device, into a big magnetic plow where we, you know, we pour juice in it, and it goes <laughs> leaving ones and zeros behind in its wake. <laughs> 4,096 of these ones and zeros form a 512-byte sector. So we have essentially written data into the gap between these two sector IDs, which is really the sector region. And the controller reports to the motherboard, okay, got it. Motherboard, pretending to be suspicious, says, oh, uh-huh, well, read that back for me. <laughs> so again, you know, it's down here somewhere by the time it, again, just starts listening for all these little sector IDs as they come along until it finds the right one. Run, runs across that sector number one and says, okay, here we go, and then starts paying attention to the data. And it sucks in these 4,096 little bits into a buffer that's on the controller. I, Generally, it's this chip here. And, <laughs> and it gets them all together, that one sector's worth, and then adds them all up, adds the bytes up to make sure that with the addition of a checksum here, to add a little gratuitous byte thrown in, that it, we, and we end up with a zero sum. It's just a quick way of knowing, hey, all the bits are probably okay. So we say, say to the motherboard, okay, I got them all here. The motherboard says, well, you know, give them to me. So they set up something called a DMA transfer, direct memory access transfer, to move the data down through the I.O. connector onto the motherboard and over to some little buffer somewhere sitting there. And then we're really done reading this one sector. So the controller says, okay, now we're done. The computer says, well, yeah, but you know, what? One sector, 512 bytes, what can you do with that these days? You know, have you seen New Lotus? <laughs> okay, I'll get busy. So, so the problem is now the computer wants a second sector, you know. And but while we were doing, we, we we got this all sector in, and then the disk kept on spinning while we were doing our checksumming and stuff and our DMA work until we got to here somewhere, and then it said, "I want number two. Well, number two, you know, went by. If, you know, we were on it for a while, then now we're on number three, even, probably. But two is gone. But that's not a big problem. Columbus demonstrated how this works. We didn't wait long enough, it's going to come back around, and we'll be fine. So it starts looking for sector number two, sure enough, runs across it, and reads in that sector. Then the computer says, okay, you know, we only got about another three megs to go, so I need sector number three. Okay, the problem is the same as before. We've moved past the beginning of three at least, by several sectors perhaps. We've got to go all the way around again. Well, so the system is working, 
We're reading and writing data. But it's not optimal. We're spending much more time waiting for the sector that we've been asked to find after just finding one than we are actually transferring data. Well, IBM, you know, invented all this stuff. And they had a solution for it. They said, let's not put sector number two right after sector number one. No one says we have to. Remember, it's just what's written in the ID that says, I am sector number or whatever I am, because we're just listening. We listen for them to see which one's going to go underneath the head next until we find the one we want. Let's put sector number two. Oh, let's give it some time. If it needs till down here somewhere, let's put sector number two here. And a couple more sector spacing, and number three. A couple more sector spacing, and number four. And so on. And continue skipping a few, running around until we finish numbering all 17 of them. Essentially, we're interleaving all of these guys. Okay. Now, computer says, let's try this again. See what you can do. So last time, we were only getting one sector per revolution. Every time it asked for it, the one we wanted just went by. So 17 sectors meant 17 revs. Now it's worse, in fact, if you have a higher density drive. This MFM, remember, gives us 17 sectors. We have RLL encoding, stands for run length limited encoding. It's a some more aggressive means for encoding the data. That gives us 26 sectors around the track. And then we have even one step further. ERLL stands for enhanced or ex enhanced expanded, or, or expanded uh, run length limited encoding. And actually, in my experience, this stands for expensive <laughs> run length limited encoding. But so, you know, it can get bad if your interleave is wrong as you crank up the number of sectors that you've got on track. Okay. So now the computer says, I want to go again. Sector number one, please. So an average of about half a revolution, and we, start, we find sector number one and suck in the data during set number one, and then do the, do, do the check summing, set up a DMA transfer, move down to the motherboard, get everything finished, and we say, we're done. The computer says, okay, I want number two. Perfect. You know, here's number two in front of us and heading towards us. It's the next one we're going to encounter. So we read through number two. And then after being done, do our check summing, use the DMA transfer, move down to the motherboard, the computer says, I want number three. Again, perfect. So, in comes number three. Well, this is a much improved situation. We're now reading almost all the time, and in fact, we're reading every third sector each time around. So clearly, in three revolutions, we've read them all. Much, much better. Well, IBM was creating the PCXT. They knew about interleaving, but being IBM, they really didn't have a clue what the right number was. But, you know, they didn't worry about it too much. They figured, hey, you know where IBM? We don't have to be right. We just sort of have to be here. People are going to buy this stuff anyway. And they did know one thing that was critical. They knew that it was better to have the sector that was next in line, that was going to be asked for, out in front of you and heading in your direction, than to already be standing on it or to have it just having passed by and leaving. Well, that suited them fine, because conservatism is their nature. And, you know, they said, well, how about six? Six sounds good. You know, that's certainly going to be out there in front of us, no matter how slow we make this XT. So, that'll give us lots of time. So, in fact, that's what we got. They shipped the IBM PC XT blue one, with a hard disk interleave that's six to one. So, it took six revolutions to read one track of data. Okay. And along came clones. And hard disk controller maker to the clones was Western Digital, who said, oh, you know, let's make some controllers here, because these IBM PCs, or compatibles, are going to be hot sellers. So they made a family of controllers, you know, the 1002 WX1s, and that whole lineage. They said, you know, we want to compete with these big blue guys. And we're in California, so we're expected to be kind of, you know, faster and crazier. Let's set our interleave to three to one. That's much better. In fact, it's twice better. Inter IBM is interleaved at six to one. 
six revolutions to read one track of data. We, Western Digital, will have our disk controllers default their interleaves at three to one. So we can read the same data on the same track as IBM in half the time, meaning that our throughput is twice as fast. So that was pretty great. Well, then I came along. And I had been writing a column for InfoWorld for about six months at that time. That was about two and a half years ago. I'm now, it's been now about three years I've been writing a Tech Talk column every week for InfoWorld. And I wanted to write, I wanted to address the issue of performance, hard disk performance, but a different dimension of it that had been spoken of before. Everyone knew about average seek times. You know, you open up your mass, mass mail catalog or your, your mail order outfit, and they show you, oh, you know, the 80 millisecond worm drive drive, I mean, at the low end, or this 17 millisecond screamer at the high end. You know when you have one of these slow ones, because you can kind of hear it arrive at the right track. And you know when you have a fast one, because your bank account is empty. Uh, and then there's everything in between. So people knew what their average seek times were. That was no mystery. But for me, I wanted to know, hey, once we get to where we've gotten over with whatever the seek time is, once we get there, how long do we have to stay before we can leave? I always find myself asking that when we're going to visit my mother-in-law. Uh, you know, how quickly can we get this over with and get this data transferred and get on to the next track? Um, so that was really the question that had not been addressed. There was a utility out there called CoreTest that everyone sort of knew of. It was in the public domain CoreTest. And it has been around since the dawn of man. I mean, it was originally named the Rock Test, and cavemen used it to see how round their rocks were. And they upgraded it finally at, I think, Rev 9.7, they made it IBM compatible, and they renamed it the Core Test, and then put it back down to Rev 1. Well, you could run it, and it would, you know, tell you something. It would say, you have 47,926 bytes per second throughput. Is that good news? I don't know. I, you know, the only thing you could do, I guess comparatively, you could have all your friends run it, and if theirs was bigger than yours, then you weren't so happy. <laughs> um, I wrote something that delivered the information in something that I felt was what was really happening. The little thing I also put in the public domain called spin test. Spin test and spin time. Two little 183-byte things. Um, I write everything in assembler. Even SpinWrite is 100%, 500k of assembly language. Um, so I took spin test and stuck it into my PC, my PC XT from the Blue Beetle. And it said six reps. To be expected, yeah, six is what I would have thought. Went over and I stuck it into my clone computer. It said 17. Western Digital Controller. Now, it always did seem a little slow. <laughs> I figured that was sort of generic cloneness, you know. <laughs> you know? But, but now I thought, wait a minute, this is just this interleaved. You know, Western Digital chose this 3 to 1 interleave. It must be that it needed 4, it needed a little more time. The computer wasn't getting done somewhere here before sector number two. It's probably just barely standing on it or somewhere in it, and it needed number two to be moved back here. So it was getting the worst possible interleave. I mean, if it's standing on it, I'd rather have two back over here, where it would have been if I didn't have any interleave, because I wouldn't have to wait quite so long. It can't be any worse than the one too tight. It's as bad as it gets, because you're on the one you've just been asked to get. So. I said, well, let's find out if this is true. So, I got 75 floppy disks. I formatted them all. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I waited for morning. <laughs> so I was fresh. And I started pumping those floppy disks into this puppy and backed up my whole hard drive. Then, a, a real experience in user friendliness. I typed debug. <laughs> I got the famous minus sign prompt. You bet it's a minus sign. Uh, 
Not a plus sign. No. And I wanted to override the default low-level format, which was three. I was going to force it to give me a four and see what would happen. So I put a four, R-A-L-4, I put a four in the A-L register of the A-X accumulator, and a one in the A-H register of the A-X accumulator. Then I typed G equals C800 colon five, and it said, welcome to Western Digital. I said, yeah, right. And then it spit out something about O-O-O-P-P-E-E-R-R-R-R-U-U-U, and I was supposed to figure out what my right precompensation cylinder was and where my right curve was to be reduced, I don't know from where to what, and about my stepping rates and something, and I figured, you know, these engineers, this is just probably bullshit, it doesn't matter, so I typed in some numbers and off it went. <laughs> so, everything seemed fine, and in about ten minutes it was all done, and uh, so I needed to put all my data back, so, you know, I spent the last half of the day with my 75 floppy, putting them back in, and then rebooted. And it did seem faster. So I did a few little things, you know, familiar things. And it was definitely running better. So I took a spin test. Stuck it in there. Four revs. Had been 17 that morning. This same morning. Now, four. So I said, my goodness. 425% difference in throughput. Think if I could do that with my mother-in-law. <laughs> you know, I could have four of them. <laughs> so I thought, how widespread is this disaster? You know, how to how many systems at WD do this? So I had since published my column and put the program out in the public domain. And I was getting letters back, Steve, it's 17. Steve, mine 17. Steve, it's 17. I went out on the road with my own disk. This was before you had, you know, you know, fear of viruses and things. And stuck it into all the computers I could find without, without fear. And... So to speak. And I tell you, Epson was at 17, and Capro was at 17, and Leading Edge was at 17. They were all at 17 reps. They were all wrong. I think Compact might have been at 6, which figured, you know, they were sort of beginning to follow IBM's conservative approach. So, so I thought, my goodness, you know, if I could come up with a way of non-destructively low-level reformatting a drive, I could probably drive any kind of car I want. <laughs> <laughs> and coffee Surf, the guys on coffee Surf sort of heard about this. I was talking about it. Because I was enough of a figure by then with the, with the, with the InfoWorld column, and I had Flickr Free, which was my first little TSR product for the IBM that eliminated the Flickr from the scrolling of the CGA adapter and sped up uh, other stuff as well. And I had done light pen stuff back in the Apple II days, a high resolution light pen for the Apple II, so they kind of knew me. They said, Gibson is talking about doing a non destructive low level format. Now, what has he been smoking out there in California? <laughs> you know, you can't, uh, low level formatting is a wipeout. And of course, they're right, it is. I mean, the worst thing that can happen to your computer is that it catches a software virus somehow. And then you innocently do something to piss off that virus, and it sticks it to you in your low-level format. <laughs> it's over. <laughs> what they didn't know is that there's another command than low-level format drive that the viruses know about down in the low-level IBM BIOS. There's one called low-level format track. Just one track. Any one you want. IBM probably put it in there because they thought, you know, maybe someone would come along and write some software that would fix a blown trap. No one ever did, as far as I know. But I thought, hey, I can use this. I'll start with the first track. I'll read all the data off of it. Low level reformat it at the right interleave. After figuring out what that right interleave is, I put the data back. 
me go to the next one. I thought, how hard can this be? You know, a couple late nights, a long weekend. <laughs> well, a year later, <laughs> I was wrapping up because it turned out there was a lot more to it. But more importantly, that I could do a lot more good. Peter Norton, you know, was the first person to figure out that when you deleted a file, it really wasn't gone. And then if you asked for it back before waiting too long, you undeleted it, you, you could have it back. As a consequence of that little discovery, I guarantee you Peter is now driving any kind of car he wants. <laughs> and in whatever town he owns. <laughs> and actually, you know, we did lunch a couple months ago because he wanted to acquire this. And he said, you know, Steve, when you came out with this, I thought you were just going to crash and burn. You were going to just nuke yourself on the spot. He said, but then the reviews started happening. People were talking about it. He said, you know, so we, we uh, went out and got a copy. I said, I bet you did, Peter. <laughs> What's in here? And he said, you put a ton of technology in there to make it safe and to really create some value. He said, you want to sell it? I said, no, no, thank you. I want to do more good things instead. Well, I figured, I've got the data off the track. I've just low-level formatted the track. Is this a safe place to put the data back? Why not find out? Because well, there's this whole aura of defects on drives. It's not good news, but they have them. You know, the manufacturers can't be very happy about it, but they print a little list of defects. Many scribe has a small list, so you get used to sort of a scroll. <laughs> See page nine. Oh, okay. Where is that? They're not happy about this, but they've got defects. So I figured, hey, let's just check on some defects while we're at it. See if this is a good place to put the data back. I did a lot of R and D. I'm fundamentally a hardware guy, which is, I think, why I write good low-level software. I'm like I'm an assembly language for now. Um, so I got out all my equipment, and I learned a lot of other interesting things too. I found out what the biggest nightmare that these drive designers and makers, and manufacturers have. Their biggest nightmare, they call long-term drive alignment drift. Long-term drive alignment drift. Look at this. It's all made out of metal. You know, it's got yellow metal, silver metal. It's got nice, real, real nice, sort of expensively chrome kind of metal. It's got some tastefully matte finish <laughs> metal, and yellow and silver and all kinds. It's all screwed together with screws. It all screws down here in the motor and everything. And these get very hot when you run them. When you put your hand on the drive after a couple hours, oh, baby, I mean, this is where your 220 watts goes in your power supply. It goes to heating this puppy up. They make, you know, good irons. Actually, those, those Seagate ST225s with those nice little right. rounded edges, oh, boy, <laughs> they, won't, they won't catch on your pockets. <laughs> that makes a great iron. Or a doorstop. Yeah. So it's all made out of metal. Well, what does metal do when you heat it up? It expands. And in fact, different metals expand at different rates. There's something called the coefficient of thermal expansion, which describes the rate at which metal expands as it gets hot. So here we have this thing made out of all kinds of different metal. We don't have you know, the alien technology yet to just make it one humongous lump. So it's complicated. It's all screwed together. Okay, now imagine. I'm a screw. <laughs> These are my threads. And I'm this screw, the one that's responsible for holding down this corner of the motor, keeping it in place. Now, you've perhaps never spent any time contemplating the life of a screw. <laughs> it's a very simple life. No, a good screw just, just really... <laughs> Calm down there. <laughs> just... 
wants to be the very best screw possible. <laughs> That's its whole purpose. It's a simple request, I know. It, uh, during manufacture, it got very well screwed. And it's going to try to, by definition, to hold everything in place. Yet, it's made of a different metal than this base plate that it got screwed down into, and a yet a different metal than this massive, black, intimidating kind of motor, which it's, to, it, which it's been told that it has to hold absolutely motionless. The motor is made of iron, the screw is made out of steel, it's in an aluminum base plate. All of these things are doing their own thing as you heat this up, and we've already seen it gets very hot in there. So, it heats up, the screw expands, the hole expands that the, the screw is in, this, this motor is tugging on it because it wants to expand at a different rate. The three other screws here are all trying to do their own job of being good screws and hold that motor absolutely motionless. Well, it's amazing to me that it works both hot and cold. And in fact, many people who specialize in recovering data from drives do so by deliberately changing the temperature of the drive because it's known to have an effect. The point is, the alignment is not even constant from morning until night. Now, the end of the day happens. The computer gets turned off. It begins cooling off again. Our little screw is getting pinched. The motor is, is shrinking. It is shrinking. The hole is in a shrinking. All these little threads that have been trying to hold on for dear life all day are, you know, getting stretched back down. Is this in exactly the same place exactly as it was in the morning? No. It can't be. We've got molecules, after all. They're kind of grainy down on that level. It's amazing to me that it works the second day after one of these thermal expansion contraction things. The fact is, it doesn't work after a couple of years. It begins failing. This is a mechanical device. Wear and tear. It's got a little rack and pinion system back down here with gears that are wearing and rubbing on each other over time. So the alignment is going to drift. Long-term drive alignment drift. Now, of course, you've got gravity. Gravity is a bias. It's a force. So amid all this expanding and contracting and all these little screws trying to hold themselves exactly where they, walk, where they are, there's a siren call of gravity. Hello, come over here. You know, kind of pulling at everything. And these little screws are saying, okay, I'm trying. You know, and they're going to succeed to some degree, to varying degrees. Varying from drive to drive. Long-term drive alignment. So let's say for the sake of argument that our tracks are drifting inwards. sort of a function of the way the drive is designed, how it's aging, how the relative tightness of the various screws who are tugging on each other and who's winning in the long term. But what does that mean? We saw that we've got defects. So there are defects wandering around in here in various places along the surface. Clearly, drifting alignment affects defects because defects are on the surface. They're surface defects. They are of the surface. And they're not moving. But the tracks are moving relative to the defects. Because after all, the thing that determines where a track is, there's no grooves in this surface. It's a smooth, uniform surface. What determines where the tracks are is where the stepper motor ends up with all of its mechanical connections holding the head. That's the track. And if, over time, this is aging and altering its alignment just subtly, then the head is going to be in a slightly different position on track 100 than it was when it was made. So if a defect was right there, but the track is drifted away, the defect has floated, essentially. So that, for example, this defect is in between tracks. The manufacturer didn't find it. But a year later, this track has drifted inwards and is now smack dab in the middle of that defect. So we have a new defect. This one was found, but because all the tracks are migrating as a whole, that track is correspondingly drifted inward, out of danger. No more defect there. Fact is, defects are not a static phenomenon of a hard disk. They are inherently dynamic in nature. Now, 
Miniscribe has this little chart that says as shift defect criteria. I always thought that was interesting. You know, as shift defect criteria. One good UPS man can triple the length of this list. <laughs> but I don't think that's what they're referring to. I think they paid some attorney $20,000 or on retainer to say, you know, you're telling me that the alignment is changing on these drives? Well, yes, sir. Well, what does that do to the defects? Oh, well, they, they change too. And we better not say defect criteria. We better say as shipped defect criteria. <laughs> oh, you're worth your money, aren't you, Mr. Attorney? Well, that's why I came. Um, <clears throat> they know this is going to change. It doesn't help their sales any if they advertise it, so they don't talk about it much. Besides, they got our money and cashed our check. You know, and this is probably good for a year or two, six months. If you have a Seagate, you measure it in weeks. <laughs> I'm just kidding about Seagate, of course. They're just the biggest. What about our data, though? That's why we're here, is our data, not defects. Well, something interesting happens with the data. If the head drifts a little bit from where it originally was, but it can still be, it's still able to read the data, and it ever writes it, the data gets realigned. And if, if there was a gradual long-term alignment drift, and we were periodically realigning the data, well, it tracks with the drifting alignment. So it balances out. Over time, the tracks are drifting. But the alignment, but the alignment is drifting. The data is tracking off. And in the cause sort of an overall upheaval of the drive that rewrites it all, we'll do that. No? Oh my god. There is an empty cluster beginning of my drive. Well, we can't let that stay there because that would make a fragment. So, let's run our optimizer again. Pick up 70 megabytes and move it over. No! One cluster. Got that little sucker closed off now. The little opening is now over there with the rest of them, the free space. In the process, we read and wrote the entire drive and inherently realigned all the drive's data. So the data is tracking with this drifting alignment. But there's something which isn't. There's something which has absolutely no opportunity for this realignment. And that's the low-level format. It's written during the first minutes of this virgin drive birth. And never again. We just read it. Even when we're writing data into the sector, remember, we find the sector by reading the low-level ID first. Over time, the alignment drifts so far that the head passes right past, and you get sector not found, or we try ignore. Drives need some respect. They're going to get it from you sooner or later. It, it's less painful if you give it to them sooner. SpinWrite does three things. <laughs> the first time you use it, it optimizes the interlude for you. If you didn't have the next sector arriving as exactly the one was being asked for, it will change it so that you do. And perhaps you get a free performance boost for all time, for all time just by numbering these sectors properly. More importantly, I think, it is a long-term, low-level format maintenance tool for hard disk drives. Run it three times a year, four times a year, weekly if you use Seagate drives. And, I'm just kidding. And, and it will keep the drive aligned. It will scrub the surface for defects that are coming and going in and out of the tracks, literally tracking them as the tracks drift across them over the years. There's no reason our drives have to be unreliable. This is why they are dying over time. SpinRide has proven effective over and over and over in keeping drives alive. It's simple to use, simple to sell. It won't ask your customers about cylinders and heads and sectors. You can't make it ask you those things. You just run it, and it works. Thanks very much.
have a three copies. It knows. Okay. A free copy for someone. Can I do a little orange ticket? Okay. Nine. Yeah. 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 Oh, that's uh, all. That's I'm in. Nine, eight, two, seven. Oh, and I lost a few U sixes. Zero, okay. one. Here. Hey, oh, got it. Uh, Thanks, guys. Wow, you did have hair. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love that. Now tell me again, that was that was a lecture you gave at Soft Cell? It was a yeah, it was a series of presentations and and frankly, what I heard was th th there were many vendors that were hosted by this big software distributor. This was the largest distri software distributor in the country at the time. There were many vendors who were hosted. So people had to there were only so many slots during the day when you could attend one uh -huh. and so 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 attendees who were retailers you, you you'll have noticed that i referred to what makes spinrite easy to sell because i recognized that my audience were resellers they were they software was a distributor these guys had computer stores right and so they would be buying my product from my distributor soft sell and then reselling it to the end user uh -huh. which was you know, the good old days of shelf space you don't need uh, that exactly and so um, uh, I completely. Lost I'm sorry, mind. I didn't mean to throw you. <laughs> <laughs> so you were just saying this is this was to the distributors this, and to the and I didn't realize it, but also to shop owners who will buy from Soft Cell. Yeah, because and at so the they time would record also, this because not everybody could get in to see it. I think that's what we were. Where oh, we were oh, oh with I that. know what I was saying. Right was was that there were there were many more vendors making presentations than there were time slots. So. It was necessary to select those which you would see. And what I ended up hearing through the grapevine was that the word spread like wildfire, that you had to come see Gibson. Oh, that's so that's our, our little room was like standing room only, packed with people all lining the back and the sides because there weren't enough chairs because I ended up draining the audience from the other presentations. And in fact, the other vendors wanted to come to see what the hell was going on in this one room. So uh, it, it ended up being a lot of fun and, uh, you know, and, and some good laughs too, as, as we all saw. I just want to show you in, in that year, in 1990, this is what a Mustang GT looked like. <laughs> <laughs> they, now, and I should show you my Mustang, but let me tell you, this is a good moment to take a break. When we come back, I want to talk a little bit about but what you would amend from that uh, speech, what's changed ah, right. in hard drives. But before we do that, let's thank our friends at Ford. Again, another great sponsor all year long uh, supporting our show. Uh, they, they, they support Twit because they want to reach technology enthusiasts to let them know it, it ain't your grandfather's Ford anymore. It is a high-tech consumer electronic device. Actually, that 90 looks pretty good, I got to say. I like the styling of my uh, my current Mustang, my 2010 Mustang, the the 20 year later edition, and I love the things like Ford Sync that they're putting in. My next Ford is going to be a Ford Fusion. I'm buying that next month because I want the state of the art technology. Uh, it's a plug in hybrid for one thing, but also things like the Bliss, which is available in the 2013 uh, Fusion and the uh, 2013 Taurus. Bliss is the blind spot information system. It detects vehicles entering your blind spot. It alerts you with a little tone and a light on the side mirror to let you know you can't see a car, but there is one there protecting nice. you from merging into traffic. I know, isn't that nice? Those and same I love the acronym. That's a great Bliss, acronym. Bliss, yeah. Oh. Those same uh, Bliss blind spot monitors will also let you know is your, as you're backing out if there's a car in the cross traffic, it's a cross traffic alert. And there are a lot of times where I'm backing out. I am just taking, I'm taking it on faith because I can't see around the trucks in the parking space, that kind of thing. So this is a really, a really nice feature. This, the auto, I also want this. The auto park assist is really basically an autonomous vehicle. Just for one thing, the thing we hate the most, the thing that's hardest to do, parallel parking. You push a button on your car and you say look for a parking space that i can fit it it goes bing i got one pull forward 
You then pull forward, take your hands off the wheel, and in 24 seconds, the car spins the wheel around without any intervention on your part and parks perfectly inches from the curb. It's re- I've done it. It's amazing. It's spooky. It's the coolest thing in the world. You can find out more about these technologies and a whole lot more built into Ford vehicles by, well, two things. You could go to the website, ford.com slash technology. That's the technology website. But you could also go to a Ford dealer near you and say, I want to try that. I want to try that park assist. Go further, ford.com slash technology. These are not your father's Fords. Um, all right. So what is, you know, I mean, it's the fundamentals you describe in that in that video are the, are the same, right? Yes. Probably the... The major change has been, well, obviously density. So the I talk about MFM and RLL and ERLL encoding, uh, not too much, but, you know, that's all in the past now. Now we have PRML, which is as spooky as it sounds, uh, which, which is partial read maximal likelihood, where our drives are literally guessing at wow. the data because the bits are so tightly packed they really can't wow. see them any longer. Wow. Um, so so that's one change. But also, the, the, the addition of servo information, that was the big change. It used to be that we had what I would call dead reckoning, serv- you know, dead reckoning head positioning where there was a, a, like a stepper motor and a rack and pinion that would just go out 100 steps and where the head landed was where the track would be. But that meant that you had this long-term drive alignment drift problem, which was one of the things that Spinrite really excelled at. Because as I explained in the video, only low-level reformatting the drive before the alignment got too bad could cure the problem. And of course, Spinrite famously was the only non-destructive, low-level reformatter. That's what it did. Um, And that's why Peter Norton, when he wanted to buy it, said he thought he was going to look down towards Irvine and Laguna Hills and see a big mushroom cloud coming up and, you know, because he just didn't think you could do that safely. So so that's the big change. Um, uh, But, you know, when I talk about sector marks and sector headers and, and, uh, of course, interleaving disappeared as the as the data channel got fast enough so that we were able to br- suck in all the data off the drive in one revolution rather than needing like a three to one or a four to one interleave. So it would take three, you could only get every third sector or every fourth sector per revolution. So, so that changed. Um, but, you know, the underlying technology is the same. And, you know, so many things about computers are like that. I mean, when, when you were first saying that, Lee, I was thinking, yeah, word processing, you know. <laughs> We have GUI, right. but we almost had it back then. I mean, we had the Windows 3.0 back in that era. Sure. And and we had, you know, a micrographics designer was that great graphics drawing program. And, you know, we got more buttons now, but it really hasn't changed. Well, maybe it's changed because you could put it in your pocket. Yeah, that's that's, a, and, that's and, run and run it on batteries. And run on batteries, yeah. That's and it costs about <laughs> one one millionth the cost <laughs> per, for per the mip. equivalent power. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Really fun. Just, uh, I think we should do more of this. You have more of these? I do. Because I think this is, <laughs> well, it's educational. I mean, there, there's a lot of people who listen who were, who were kids in 1990, um, probably most of them. And uh, yeah. so I think that a lot of people, you know, this is this is good stuff. This is fun to see. Anyway, I'm, I think a perfect thing for our uh, holiday episode. We will be back on January. Will we be January second doing I'll a be. show? I hope, right. I hope. I hope. I hope you're here with me. I'll, I'll come in. <laughs> Might be a little hungover still. No, I won't be. I'll come in. Yeah. January second will be our next episode. That's a Wednesday, eleven a.m. Pacific. That's when we do security now. Two p.m. Eastern time, nineteen hundred UTC on Twit.tv. We would love to see you live, but because we, you know, the chat room. But if we can't. That's okay. Download a copy. We have on-demand versions available a lot of places. Steve has 16 kilobit versions. That's the smallest audio format. He also has transcripts. Those are even smaller. Most people get those and listen, I think. We have higher quality audio and video, too, at twit.tv. Steve also has Spinrite. Now that you know how hard drives work, maybe you ought to better get, get a copy there. That's the world's finest hard drive maintenance and recovery utility still 
to this day. What version of Spin Right were you talking about on that we're one? We're at six. Oh, that was, uh, that might have been one, one or maybe two. I mean, it was, it was, Spin Right was not very old at the time. So this was an educational tour. This was to say, hey, folks, there's something you haven't seen before. Right. And I mean, you know it's cool. All, yeah. If you'd bought Spin Right in 1990, you'd still have an upgrade path to Spin Right 6. That's right? true. That's true. Free upgrades. Every even the very first person 22 years ago will give you a discount on six. Discount. Okay. Not free. Let's get that straight, Leo. <laughs> <laughs> GRC.com. Go there right now and uh, and see. And also lots of free stuff there from Steve. Steve, I'm so glad we could talk and uh, have a great new year. A happy holiday because we're recording this before Christmas. And uh, yep. we'll see you in 2013. Can't wait. On Security Now. Security Now.